You are now listening to the Supply Chain Secrets Podcast with Brian Most and Don Davis. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Brian Most, SVP of Retail Strategy at NYSHEX and former VP of Supply Chain at Walmart. And I'm Don Davis. I'm the Senior Vice President of Carrier Strategy here at NYSHEX and former Executive of Hapag Lloyd and CMA CGM. And we're back again today with our podcast, Supply Chain Secrets. Don and I are really excited to announce today we have our very first guest on the show, Mr. Lars Jensen, who is certainly no stranger to many in the supply chain industry. He's a leading expert in container shipping and specializes in combining analytic skills, in-depth knowledge, and container shipping industry knowledge, and his management experience. He's often used as an expert speaker at international shipping conferences, as well as private engagements focusing on clients that want updated information on market developments. Lars, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. So today, uh, we want to do something a little bit different. We'd love to, to once in a while talk about current events or headlines that are in the news. And you know, we've all worked in this virtual workplace for, for the most part for, for the past year and the traditional water cooler or break room talk is, is just kind of hard to have. So maybe we'll, we'll have a little bit of that today and um, there's no shortage of headlines. So uh, you guys want to get started? Absolutely. Go ahead. Awesome. Well, I think we've, we have to start the show with, uh, with the issue going on right now in, in the Suez Canal. So the, the evergreen ship the ever given 20,000 TEU ship uh, is currently uh, blocked, blocking the, the Suez Canal, and uh, it has caused all sorts of ripple effects. And, and Lars, I know you've been, been watching this one closely, but would love to hear kind of the updated information and, and your perspective on, on what's happening here. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're now three and a half days into, in, into this debacle. And from my perspective, we are now entering the period where this changes from being let's call it an annoyance to be something that's going to have significant uh, ripple effects. Maybe to take the annoyance part first. Under normal circumstances, if you then suddenly have the Suez Canal closed a couple of days, that would cause serious problems. However, reality is that the supply chains were already in disarray after all the pandemic effects of the last year. So with most vessels being four, five, six, seven days late anyway, a, an additional delay of two days would barely be noticeable in, in this environment. But we have now passed that point. And the ripple effects will materialize over the coming months now, no matter what we do. Even if the canal was to open tomorrow, what you would then be faced with is a massive logjam of vessels that will take many days just to clear the backlog. So we are now looking for some of these vessels of a week delay, no matter what we do, at a very minimum. We are already seeing carriers now redirect vessels to take the long route around Africa. That's also, to me, a pretty good indication. They don't expect this to be resolved in the short term. In terms of ripple effects, there will be many. First of all, this is going to be felt, especially with shippers in the Mediterranean, shortly after that in North Europe. It's actually the export shippers that will feel it the most, because they will have cargo they want to take down to the port to put on ships, ships that are right now not arriving because they are stuck in port. The next ripple effect you're going to see is the capacity shortage on containers, on empty containers that has been headlines for the last four months. This problem is now going to get worse. It is not going to get better because a large part of solving that is the repositioning of empties from Europe back to Asia. That is now stuck in the logjam as well. So that's another ripple effect. A third ripple effect is, of course, when we talk Suez, we tend to think about Asia and Europe. But U.S. East Coast will be similarly impacted. When you have a large amount of cargo that goes on the Suez rounding, and the knee-jerk effect might be to say, well, that's not really an issue because we can just use the other U.S. roundings. In normal times, yes, but these are not normal times. The other roundings to the, to the West Coast and through the Panama Canal already suffers from a severe shortage of vessel capacity and a massive congestion at the ports. So redirecting the Asia via Suez to U.S. cargo onto the, I was about to say, traditional U.S. rounds is not really operationally possible. And the third ripple effect you're going to feel is if you go around Africa, 
This will effectively remove a large amount of vessel capacity from the market due to the much longer sailing distances. All vessels in the world are already sailing. So the question then becomes, where do we take this extra capacity from? And that is likely to be done partially, of course, by impacting the services directly hit, but also other services. Would I continue to operate the way I do on the transatlantic, or would I divert some ships to help with this? Would I continue to operate as per normal from US to Australia, or would I divert some ships from this? This is going to have a ripple effect on all trades. Absolutely. Don, when you think from a carrier perspective, what, what are you thinking if you're a carrier right now? Uh, I'm thinking, um, I hope this is going to be resolved soon and probably a false hope because I'm sure they're getting bombarded with questions and it's never pleasant to try and respond to something that you're not quite sure how long it's going to last or what the implications are. And uh, it's very difficult to cope with something so unpredictable particularly when you're talking about customers cargo transit times and this is definitely going to have an impact on your um on your transit but you're just not quite sure what you're going to do how long do you wait versus make a decision to turn around and it, with hindsight you know it could look completely different the decision you make but you're just trying to make dis the best decision you can with the information you have that's available and it would seem logical that it's you're probably at a point where you need to start thinking about taking the long route. And even though that has transit time implications, at least you're dealing with certainty versus just waiting and hoping. And, and that just doesn't really feel good to customers. Usually that you're just, you're just waiting without any sense of when it's going to get resolved. Because I think most people thought if it wasn't resolved quickly, it's probably going to take a while and a while could be seven days. A while could be 14 days. It's, it's just hard. It's anybody's guess. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the biggest question, right? I mean, there's certainly been various news reports, uh, even from some of the salvage companies saying that it, it could take weeks, right? I mean, they're, they're certainly trying to dig out the bow. They've got tugs trying to pull. They're, they're even hoping, you know, for, for, for tides that are, are going to help, you know, free the, free the ship. So to your point, I, I'm not sure anybody really knows. And, you know, for me, from a shipper perspective, this is just another reminder, you know, 2020, 2021 is just this reminder for this continuous need for diversification, right? The idea of have also having visibility into your supply chain and, and resilience. I've heard Lars talk about those things a number of times over the last 12 months. And the idea of being a supply chain manager and thinking that these are just one off issues, just I don't think you can you can accept that anymore. I think you just have to know that you're going to walk into your job each and every day and you never know exactly what's going to happen in the world. Now, to a lot of us, that's the excitement of the job. But if you don't have that resilience and diversification built into your supply chain, you're just going to have a ton of challenges. And, and I think the idea first of just knowing what cargo you have, you know, do I even have cargo on the Evergreen ship or do I have cargo on it on any of these ships that are either waiting or being diverted so I can communicate internally to to my stakeholders and, and make decisions on future cargo. And then the last thing is Lars talked about the idea that if you're a TP eastbound eastbound shipper and you go to the East Coast, you know, the idea of having um, freight that flows both through the Panama and the Suez Canal. Right. And, and, and being able to continue to flow freight if one of those was was not open, shippers that employ those types of strategies are going to benefit in these types of situations. And Brian, do you think this is one of those cases where as a shipper, you then say or someone, some senior manager might say to you, avoid the canals that that you, we're, we're contract planning now for next year and any service that uh, uses a canal, you avoid it? Or do you think that's something that could happen? Or do you think that this is something that you just say, well, you know, one of those things that we don't expect to happen again, so we shouldn't try and plan around it? Now, nah, to me, it's all about minimizing risk. And, and sometimes there's only certain, you know, certain ways you can get to, to places, right? But this idea of saying, I'm going to optimize for, for transit, for price, for diversification, etc. And I may have 75% of, of my cargo that, that transits the Panama Canal because 
it is the best and uniquely fits where, where my network needs. But this idea of having something meaningful, 20%, 25%, a third, that also uses the Suez Canal, so I have a meaningful outlet should something like this happen, I can work with existing partners, um, both with carriers and with ports, to, to, to shift cargo if I need to. Um, so to me, it would be talking to that, that, that executive about optimizing for our network, but building resilience and redundancy in should a situation like this happen. To, to, to me, this might also be one of those times where, I mean, uh, at, at least this is the way I see it from a shipper perspective, there is a very high risk, and I understand the inclination right now to spend time on the wrong problem. There would be an inclination for shippers right now to be extremely concerned about what happens to my cargo on those boxes stuck in that queue off the Suez Canal. Here's how I would look at it. I'd say, I, don't, I wouldn't spend time on that because nobody knows. It's, it, it, it's stuck there. Nobody knows. It's not something I can do anything about, no matter what I do. However, I know there's a freight train coming a few weeks and a few months down the line because the ripple effects here will be port congestion, lack of containers, blank sailings. So I would instead spend my time on saying, okay, if I try to project where will these ships be three, four, five, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 weeks down the line, what are the sailings that are now going to be cancelled? How do I make sure that I at least get my cargo moving in April, May, June, and July? That's something I can do something about right now. But looking at the cargo that right now is stuck in that jam, that is the last thing to spend time on because honestly, nobody knows and there's nothing you can do. No, it's a, it's a really good point. And then if you don't have some of those alternatives um, already established, you know, now to your point would be the time to start. Obviously, you might be behind some of those that already have other established routes or uh, relationships with providers in some of those other lanes. But I think it's great advice, Lars, to focus on because I think it really speaks to just the bigger issues, right? This is, is one issue and it certainly is dominating the headlines. But if we talk about overall market, right? I mean, you know, one of the headlines that came out of, out of the TPM was this idea that container chaos will take through Q3 to resolve, right? Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But there is this perspective that um, some of the disruption that we have had will continue on. And, and Lars, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on the broader market disruption. Yeah, the, the, the problem here is, I mean, before this Suez uh, debacle happened, I would also have the perspective that the problems we're seeing now, they should have abated by end of Q2 in a normal and relatively benign environment. But right now, this is anything but a normal and benign environment. Under normal circumstances, had the market been normal, we could have handled this uh, Suez blockage because there's usually excess capacity in the system. Reality right now is there is zero excess capacity because all of that has been soaked up with the pandemic fallout. So we have no buffer in the system. So whatever disruptions we had over the last six months, there is no way we can now clean up on those until not only that the Suez Canal opens, but we have to wait to the ripple effects of that one is dealt with. Um, I, I know one of the things that has been dominated the last couple of months is, of course, this massive logjam of vessels waiting off the California coastline in particular. It doesn't take many more days of closing the Suez Canal then you can look a few weeks or a month into the future and you can see the same image of the major ports in Europe. The major ports in Europe are extremely efficient, very good at what they do. But when you open the canal, you're going to see cargo come like ketchup out of a ketchup bottle that has been stuck down there. And it doesn't take a lot more days of additional cargo on top. Then you also run out of capacity in the European ports. And the problem then becomes exactly the same as, for example, in California. The port has a limited capacity for how many vessels can you handle per day. That's problem number one. And when you then do get the cargo off, there's a limit as to how many trucks and barges and rail wagons you have behind the port to actually clear it out of the port to start with. So when you think about um, learning from what we've experienced in, in LA Long Beach and applying that, so either learning what not to do or what to do, 
again, Don or, or Lars, is there anything from a carrier, shipper, or terminal operations perspective you'd say, we've learned this and let's apply it or, or not apply it to, to maybe what, what's going to happen in Europe? No, I was, I was saying, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a learning point. It was something I started uh, annoying people with already several months ago. Where, where when I was told, well, how should we make our supply chain strategy for 2021? And basically my standard response ever since, and this just emphasizes it even further, is don't plan for just-in-time supply chains for 2021. You will be horribly disappointed. Don't plan for the cheapest possible freight because you will be at the back of the line. Resilience is the name of the game. That counts also when you go forward here. So right now you have no idea when the cargo will arrive. At some point in time, the Suez Canal will open. You will receive finally an advisory from the carrier saying, well, your 27 boxes of garden furniture is now due to arrive in Hamburg on April 22nd. Don't rush out and just put it in the bank that the cargo will actually be accessible to you on April 22nd. You might be lucky and it is. Or it might be a week, or it might be two weeks, because we might run into this ketchup effect. Don, what do you think on on just in general market? You know, I know the headline says Q3 to resolve, but essentially, is there going to be any lull as we go from where we are today into into peak season? Is it just going to be one continuous stream? Do you see any breaks? What do you think? I do not see any breaks. Um... I, I see a couple of things. And in in my role, I talk to a lot of carriers. I talk to a lot of NBOs. And I think the first observation is carriers are trying to really manage expectations this year in terms of their contracting strategy. And they're getting a number of requests for customers to increase MQC, to look at um, new, you could see customers are looking at new carriers and they're trying to bring their business to someone else. And and carriers are really being hesitant, I would say, in terms of taking on too much MQC or taking on too many new customers because my, my impression is they want to deliver a good result in 2021 and really clearly manage expectations. But what you're also seeing is that, on the other hand, that there's people that are starting to get concerned about what they're going to do because some companies have significant growth plans their year-on-year growth has been tremendous and now they need to find a home for their cargo. So I think what that points to is that a very, very strong market leading into the third quarter. And I think if you look at the third quarter as the traditional peak season on top of volumes that are already expected to increase, I don't see any sort of lull until maybe after Golden Week. So you're talking fourth quarter of this year. Um, does that roll into Chinese New Year for next year? Quite conceivably, it could. Uh, I think there's a number of things that we don't know at this point, but it's not. Uh, wouldn't be a huge surprise to me to see the strength of the market continue, because again, you're not seeing this outlet of capacity, or that there's some new service coming online that could handle all this additional volume. I think it's going to be very difficult. So I, I don't see much of a change or much of a reason to believe it's going to change based on what we're hearing today. Yeah. You know, Lars, there's been this talk of once um, vaccinations get out and we reach, you know, whatever herd immunity is, is that there there could be this shift between consumers hunkering down and, and buying, you know, again, goods for their homes and then trading off into services or travel or things of that nature. Do you see that happening or any effect on demand and what we see for, for the second half of the year? We're not seeing any signs of it happening yet. Uh, that, that one is very simple. I would, however, still hold out the belief that at some point in time, you will see the shift. Uh, mm. the, the question which is almost impossible to answer is, when will it happen and how quickly will it happen? Both of them are important for the container flows. If it happens quickly and suddenly, I could certainly see a handbrake being pulled on the part of the importers. Say, hang on a second, suddenly our sales are plummeting. Maybe we should hold off ordering more goods, at least for a little while until we figure out what's going on. So you can have this 
short term period of a month or two where suddenly uh, container demand goes into reverse and then it normalizes after that. The problem is no one knows when this happens. I mean, this side of World War II, we have never had such a constraint placed upon consumers and what you can uh, spend money on. So there really isn't anything to model it on. If this shift, however, happens very gradually, we might not see that backlash because then it's just going to be a slow easing off for the importers. And, and let's keep in mind right now, despite the enormous boom in cargo in recent months, the latest numbers on inventories actually shows retail inventories are down. And that's despite all the cargo that came in. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when you talk about some of those headlines, to your point, we don't know when it's going to happen, but we do know what's happening now. And, you know, some of the headlines read retail sales rise 7.8% in February as consumers remain hunkered down. You know, U.S. front U.S. importers front loading that adds to bullish Trans-Pacific Q2 outlook, et cetera. And then back to the, the disruption effects on retailers that we've talked about. Um, when you have headlines that says U.S. retailers see millions in sales delays amid shipping log jams in the L.A. Times or Peloton supply chain is broken, $100 million won't fix it from freight waves. You know, Nike sales growth slows because of supply chain issues. When these companies are having to talk about supply chain issues because they are creating financial material impacts, I mean, I think that tells you just how deep, right, these, these problems are. And you touched on this idea of saying, hey, if, if you're a shipper, to, to think that you are going to seamlessly flow goods just in time is probably not a good strategy or negotiating for, for the lowest rate is probably not a good strategy. And I think there's a lot of shippers that are caught, you know, because that's what they've always done and that's what they're used to doing. But this idea of saying, not this year. This year, I'm going to be more focused on what is a fair rate that I can invest in price and receive a degree of predictability or a lot reliability that allows me to start to make an impact on some of those opportunities that are causing lacking lack of sales or, or out of stocks. Um, because you may be trying to negotiate to save a couple hundred bucks on, on your ocean freight rate, but the downstream effects could actually turn into millions. Mm. But, but but you can say here you're touching on also a different topic that at, at least in the last year tends to have been somewhat forgotten because uh, at least that's my view on it. Uh, I, I tend to call the pandemic noise. It's large scale noise. It's huge volatility, but it's noise. It's a temporary effect. We have an underlying fundamental shift in this industry that's actually far more important. It's very much like when we had the financial crisis. The financial crisis was not important. It was noise. But underneath that, the entire industry shifted because we went from this high growth environment to a more mature environment. And that fundamentally changed dynamics and started the whole consolidation process. We are at a point where that process has now come to its conclusion. They actually had already prior to the pandemic. It just went unnoticed. You have a structural situation going forward where carriers have a far larger degree of pricing power than they ever had. That's because of the consolidation. That's not going to change. You have carriers that now have acquired the ability to tactically turn up and down capacity to match it to demand. They don't have to start price wars to fill their ships. That's here to stay, irrespective of the pandemic. And on top of that, after 10 years of gradually absorbing overcapacity, 2021 is actually where you got to the point where the overcapacity was absorbed, irrespective of the pandemic. You are heading into a structural upside. Carriers are now beginning to order vessels more and more, but that means this upside at the earliest will end in 23 or in 24. So the new normal that we would be getting, no matter whether we had a pandemic or not, is one where the pricing power the shippers have enjoyed over the last 30 years has been severely eroded. It's a market where the carriers, to a much larger degree, can control capacity. And it's an upcycle where you will have temporary capacity shortages, no matter what you do. So on that basis, Lars, do you believe then that this new rate level we've seen, particularly in the Trans-Pacific, that that rate is here to stay and you would see less rate volatility than you might have seen in years past? 
Uh, that's two different questions. Uh, let's take them one by one. The rate levels we see now is, from what I see, overshooting the market. Uh, I clearly understand the carrier's impetus. Of course, when you have an extremely strong market, sure, you sell your product at the price you can sell it to. Um, I, I get that. It's overshooting the mark. Uh, what is the level we should expect going forward? Uh, and what at least I have my eyes fixed on is, remember 2016. In 2016, the market crashed horribly. And if you look at the freight rates, both spot and contracts in many trades, it took an entire level shift downwards, which was, of course, warranted tactically that year. And the carriers have been trying ever since to reverse that level shift. As a first fixed point, a benchmark, I would look for that level shift to be permanently erased, which means the level you should be looking for as, let's call it the new normal, is back where we were in 2014-2015, which is actually substantially up compared to where we were in 2019, but also quite a bit lower than the prices that are right now in the market, because the ones right now, of course, are also colored by the tactical situation. Then... The other one on the volatility, I, I would expect to see a much more stable rate environment in the future. Uh, the way I look at it is, again, because of the carrier's ability to, to turn up and down uh, on, on the capacity side. So in, in the, let's call it the good old days, uh, the normal state of affairs was a permanent price war. And then there was a few festive events where the carriers could turn up the prices and make money. Going forward, I see it as the exact reverse. You're going to have a higher but more stable price environment. And then, yeah, on a few events, you might have a price war and prices will drop. But the balance between the two are going to be reversed. So this is, is to both both of you guys. I, I think that shippers, because this past year has just been so difficult, they're, they're looking for any ray of hope. And so to see a headline like somebody like Evergreen, you know, spend billions of dollars on 20 new ships or what have you thinking that, oh, maybe the carriers are, are going back to their old ways. Uh, you know, Lars explained, even if they are going back to their old ways, there's, there's still several years uh, before we get there. But is there anything inside of, of the numbers that say, maybe you don't get excited yet, shippers, that this is either replacement tonnage or it tends to more lean towards... Uh, trying to meet environmental goals, or maybe the ships aren't even as big as, as they are today. I, what, what would you look at inside of the data that would say, don't don't get too excited yet? Yeah, I mean, for, for, first things first, I mean, uh, until recently, the order book was still only at about 10%, which was even not enough for replacement tonnage. Now we are pushing about 15%. So finally, it's beginning to look a little like something. Um, when I look at the vessels that are being ordered, increasingly uh, the carriers are taking a step down. Most of the orders coming in now, that's the 14,000, 15,000 TEU range, not the ultra-large ones. I see that as a positive sign, and actually the shippers should also long-term see it as a positive sign. Because going down slightly in size, that means that the carriers, rather than go for ultra-large ships would rather go for a higher service frequency. You can have more weekly services with that kind of tonnage, which at the end of the day would also mean you can cover more port pairs directly. You will have a more fine-grained network. But that's not going to be something you will see the effect of for the next two or three years. Yeah, I think that um, with the order book, there's just certain challenges that carriers have in terms of thinking about ordering ships and thinking about what they're going to do with their uh, environmental emissions policy and how do they how do they tackle that I think that there's um, quite a bit of thought I think some carriers have come out already and given their uh, ambitions to be carbon neutral at a certain point I think there's certain uh, implications on the vessel side you can see that LNG is a way forward for some carriers but, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to convert a ship or very expensive to convert a ship, uh, an existing ship to LNG. So does that mean that you have to acquire new ships? I think these are some of the, the things that carriers are looking at. I think Rolf Havanyansa was just talking about uh, this very thing uh, because they converted one of their ships to LNG and it was quite expensive. So, um, but it's it's... It's something carriers are looking at and experimenting with. And I think until 
they're clear on the cost implications and what that looks like and, and decide on their way forward, then you're going to see a little bit more comfort in terms of the order book and how carriers are going to start ordering ships. But I still think there's a lot of questions around that carbon neutral um, ambition and, and what does it mean and what's it going to take to get there. And once that starts to become clear, then carriers are going to become more comfortable with uh, replacing some of the ships they have today. Just as a side comment here, this is also where the fallout from Suez is going to be interesting to watch. Because there's clearly been a ramp up in the focus on environmental emissions also from shipping in recent years. As long as the Suez is closed, forcing everybody to go around Africa, this is going to have a major impact on the emissions numbers, not just from container shipping, but from all shipping lines. And there really isn't any alternative right now. That's going to cause a major stir at some point as well. Yeah, you know, I just wonder inside of the technologies, do, do either one of you have any insights as to maybe what some of the leading technology, I know technologies are, I know that people are testing LNG, some are still retrofitting with scrubbers. Is is there anything that looks like it's leading or is it still just really in, in test and learn phase? At, at least what I've seen so far, it appears to be in... Uh... Let's call it test and learn, but not quite. I mean, I, I, th I think a good indication is, for example, the announcement from Musk a few weeks ago that they were going to order a methanol feeder ship for delivery in 2023. The interesting part about that is at least it's a reasonable size ship. It's a 2000 TEU feeder ship because ships of that size in other sectors already exist running on methanol. So when we're saying trials, it's not like it's a 5 TEU ship. It's not a mega carrier either. But and, and this might be where, I mean, remember my background is in theory, not in practice, actually theoretical physics. But, but the way I always look at it is, if you can build something as a workable prototype, then it is just a matter of scaling. And if engineering has turned human, learned humanity anything over the last 200 years is once something actually works, making it smaller and more powerful, that's just a matter of time. And when I look at all these different fuels, not just methanol, but all but the hydrogen and ammonia and all the other ones, we're at a point where it works. We do have working prototypes. So it is not cutting edge science anymore. It is a good old fashioned hard work on engineering. How do we then scale it? And that's where we have again and again seen that is just something that just takes time, but it will happen. Will we make it in time for 2030? I don't necessarily have a good bet, but if I was to look at my gut feel, I would tend to lean towards, yes, that is entirely feasible. Yeah. Well, it's it's great perspective. Um, Don, you bring up a, an issue before too, right? There's going to be some cost implications to all this and you know who ends up paying for it, I don't know. But I know shippers with you know spot level rates at six and eight thousand dollars certainly don't want to look to pay for <laughs> anything else at this point. But but I think it it leads to to kind of the the discussion around the situation. I think that we we've talked about this structural situation. There's no doubt that the carriers have uh, leverage this year in in terms of negotiating with with shippers and. You see headlines like carriers cherry picking customers as rates continue to head north in the Lodestar or seismic change. Maersk commits long term to long term relationships with shippers. Do, do you see this structural move and the carriers now being in a position to treat and engage customers differently? Do you see that now really starting to take effect? I, I mean, from my side, I think that, um, you know, the, all, what the leverage the carriers have is that they have the opportunity to be selective. And I think they're looking at a variety of things. I think they're looking at uh, cost to serve. Um, so if you create a bunch of cost internally and um, then you have a, a, bl a below average yield, then then carriers might be looking to reduce the amount of volume they carry with certain customers. I think there's other customers which fit a strategy. And with if it's aligned with ca carriers growth ambitions, whether that's out of a certain region to another region or um, the overall growth that they might have and, and a customer will fit into that. Maybe it's entering into new trade lanes and things like that. I think carriers have the luxury to be a lot more selective and strategic um, than they might have been in the past because the situation in the past was 
they were always trying to sign up cargo to fill their ship. And the struggle was always to make sure the ship is full. Well, that that's changed. That carriers ha are having very little trouble filling their ships. The biggest challenge for, for carriers is, of course, managing the fall down and making sure they can get that right because there's still a fair amount of fall down and ghost bookings and that starts to turn into a different topic. But to answer your question, I think that they're, they're, what I hear from carriers is there's a lot of thought around certain customers that make a ton of sense and you can see the carriers lean in, try and sign multi-year deals or take a different approach. Whereas other customers, you can hear they're being shut out and restricted and there's, there's different reasons for that. So the selectivity on the carriers is definitely being felt by the market. Now, I would also tend to look at it this way and say, I mean, the market right now clearly is in the carrier's favor and the carrier is also using that for all that is worth. I think before we see a new normality established, and as I was saying before, I mean, I very much lean towards that new, mal no, new normality being more in the carrier's favor than what we've seen in, in, in many decades. I think we still need to go through another swing of the pendulum because uh, the last year, I mean, the it, to be honest, if you're a shipper, what have you seen? You've seen your rate quadrupled and quintupled and service levels go through the floor. Uh, that is not going to leave a happy customer, no matter what the rational explanations for those developments have been, which means I also believe we need to go through another round. This is where the carriers are going to have a hard job ahead of them because they need to mend the relationships with a lot of customers over this. Uh, absolutely. That, we, we have to go through that phase as well. Yeah, and for me as a shipper, we, we've we've done webinars and we've talked about this idea that that you now have to to be essentially this this customer of choice, right? You know, if carriers now have this newfound leverage where they are going to be selectively taking shippers that match a certain profile or or help them um, from a from a network perspective, you've got to make sure that carriers know what you have to offer. So where you do have global volumes and, you know, how you forecast and how you plan and how you interact with your carrier partners, I think is, is going to be more important than ever. And if you haven't built out those capabilities, you certainly need to, to start building out those capabilities, because if this truly is a structural move and somewhat of the new normal, um, I, I think you've got to be ready for it. Now, personally, I think that it's good overall for, for the industry, more transparency, more planning, more collaboration is going to create efficiency for, for everyone. But I think this is certainly going to, to force um, or accelerate some of, some of that work that I think, you know, both shippers and carriers need to do. But if you're a shipper and you haven't started on that journey, you, you better start this year and, uh, and make meaningful strides if I think you want your cargo to be attractive. To, to, to carriers, obviously, we've talked about, you know, it being a fair, a fair rate and a profitable rate, but I think there's going to be much more than rate that allows a carrier to say that, that this is a customer of choice. No, but, um, but, but maybe to latch on to that and then stop me if uh, I'm go getting strained too far off. But one thing we... We've also here talked a lot about the capacity and volume and rates. One thing we haven't talked about is what is the differentiation the carriers can bring to the table? We make it sound like they're all selling exactly the same and exactly the same commodity. And I don't think that necessarily is true. I mean, let's go back to where we started this conversation in the beginning and say, let's look at, for example, then we have the all the, the carriers that are now stuck in a line down in the Suez Canal, there's not a single carrier that can differentiate service there. I mean, they're all just stuck in the same queue. But where the differentiation then comes in is, okay, fine, then eventually you make it out of the ketchup bottle and you have all these piles of cargo. Who then has the best network on the ground to help the customers navigate, to get the cargo out rapidly, to actually be available to get a truck, to get a chassis, to get a rail car when it is actually needed. That is where all the opportunities for differentiation actually starts to come up. It's not on the vessels themselves, even though we tend to talk a lot about those. But that's actually the important part where the bulk of both the value add and also the competition is going to. And Don, when you look at carriers, are there are there certain carriers that, that are set up to, to capitalize on that? Because I think certainly from a shipper perspective, it, there's a lot of attractiveness to be able to 
to start to get into discussions that are much more around predictability. We've, we've certainly talked about, you know, getting specific commitments. Uh, and, and right now, as, as Laura said, a, a commitment now is just, you know, getting on, getting a piece of uh, equipment, getting on a ship and not getting rolled. But this idea, maybe somewhere when networks settle more of this time definite guarantee on, on arrivals or being able to connect to other nodes of the supply chain that help fulfill um, closer to uh, distribution points, do you see certain carrier networks better positioned to be able to execute, not just promise it, but be able to execute at a high level? Uh, I do. I do. I think um, what you find is that carriers that have some sort of terminal position are able to get some sort of priority or cut corners there and, and jump the line. Um, I think you've seen that with uh, how carriers have built some priority services um, you saw that on the West Coast with priority discharge and making containers available. If you have the ability to to work with the terminals, of course, this is a bit of a different situation. Obviously, we're talking about where you have uh, severe congestion in the terminals. But I think that your relationship, the carrier's relationship with the terminal is going to make a difference. I also think that um, this is where, you know, the MERSC and CMA model where they have a forwarding component that uh, I know from my time at CMA that 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 gave them certain opportunities to use SIVA to then take on some different land side capabilities and do some different things outside of the typical carrier framework. So I do think there's things carriers can do um, and that they're certainly willing to do. And there's you're going to have some position if you have the scale, the terminal relationship or if you have a forwarder connection. I think all those things can help uh, deliver a better service for the customers. All right. Well, Lars, I just want to say thanks for coming on our podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, participating on Supply Chain Secrets. Um, for our listeners, uh, where can they find you? How can they get more information on on your company and, and if they want to connect with you? I would encourage them to go find me on LinkedIn. I spend a lot of time uh usually every day providing different updates on at least how I see the market developments and what are the key takeaways. So come find me on LinkedIn. Super. That's great. Well, thanks for a great show. And uh, hopefully we can invite you back uh, at another point in time in the near future. And uh, we can talk about the headlines again. Well, in that case, let's hope everything is open. You can invite me over uh, physically. That would be brilliant. Yeah, that would be awesome. I'd love that. Thanks for listening to the Supply Chain Secrets Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast network. 